For Cream of Media's Policy, I'm Sashni Mundi. Joining me today is author Ted Botha, here to discuss his book, Daisy Demelka. Our viewers might know Daisy Demelka as a South African woman who was hanged for poisoning two husbands for financial gain, as well as a son. Can you briefly give us some insights into her early life before she settled in Johannesburg? She grew up in Grahamstown, or outside Grahamstown, part of a very big family, 11 children, not very much money, and then went to Rhodesia, as it was called, or Southern Rhodesia, back in late 1800s to join her father and her brother, who moved up there for some reason. And then it was kind of a couple of interludes in Cape Town, and then one in Durban, where she studied nursing for a while, and then she finally landed up in Joburg. And so she, she kind of wasn't originally from Joburg, but I think like a lot of people back in those days when Joburg was this really rich city, this big kind of metropolis on the continent, people wanted to, to come there. It's kind of, you can imagine like today people, like people who wanted something more, whether they're in England or Europe or America, something they head for New York or for London or, you know, back in those days, they would head, if they were in South Africa, they would head to Joburg. So she was kind of the, that day's version of those people. Now, Daisy's story is tracked alongside various other crimes in Johannesburg between 1914 and 1932. Why was it so important for you to give as much detail to these other stories? Well, there were a couple of reasons. One was I came across these people when I was researching Daisy, and I just found their stories incredibly kind of complex and bizarre and fascinating and colorful, and the characters were just amazing. So it was the Foster Gang and Andrew Gibson and Dorothea Croft and Herman Charles Bosman and uh, you know people will read the book and find out who these characters are and they kind of all interweave through Daisy's story. They were playing out in the background, then she would come back again, then they would pop out of the kind of woodwork somewhere. And for me, it drew a picture of Joburg at the time, for one, to show that Joburg was this um, university of crime as it was called way, way, way back. And secondly, I also had a problem in that Daisy, a lot of her life was not catalogued. So um, what was told in the trial in 1932 was what was known or, and is known about Daisy. So it was a long trial and a lot came out. But those early years of why did she come to Joburg at that stage? How did she land up meeting her husband? Uh, why did she, uh, I mean, she never admitted to killing anybody, but those kind of background questions and what she was doing in Bertram's at the time, um, those were kind of all very kind of in the background. So I needed something to fill up those days when we knew she was there, we knew she was killing people, but there wasn't anything to kind of say how she was doing it or where exactly she was going. So you knew the basic movements of her life, but not like the nitty gritty. So it was a great mechanism for me to bring in these other people who were also, some of them were living right close by to her, were doing their thing and, you know, I could kind of even it out. And then she starts from halfway through the book, she starts taking over and becoming the prominent character. And I mean, the other characters still stay around but they play a lesser role. So I think it evened itself out in the end, kind of story about the criminals, about her, and of course about the city where they found themselves, which is this incredible Joburg. One of these stories involves the Foster Gang. Uh, briefly give our viewers some insights into this gang, which starts off the book. Well, the Foster Gang was um, very famous for a long time. I mean, some people still might know about them. But for me, it was a great way to open up the book because it was like a with a bang, you know. It was this crazy trio at one stage. It was four of them, of men, and they went on this not very long rampage, but it was a rampage enough that people of Johannesburg were kind of hysterical and lock up your daughters and don't go out at night. And so, I mean, they, they were, their modus operandi was like using motorbikes, going to far-flung post offices, uh, liquor stores, uh, banks, robbing them. And, you know, they, they got in trouble quite soon after they started and they, you know, they killed two policemen. That got them even into even more trouble. And so then it became this chase between the police and the foster gang. And people will have to read the book to find out what happens to them in the end. But, I mean, it actually happened not far from where we're sitting here in Bertram's. 
and uh, it was for me a perfect way and it also fit in date wise you know I mean Foster started in 1913 and Daisy kind of originally moved to Joburg in about 1909, 1910 and like her first children started dying at about the same time so it was kind of a good way for me to start and introduce people to say this like this crazy city you know and this, these chase scenes and shootings and you know it was, it was like a very colorful way to open the book. Tell us about the research needed for a story such as this dating back to the 20s and 30s and consisting of so many side stories. The research, uh, unfortunately South Africa doesn't have the kind of digitization that they do overseas so a lot of our newspapers if you can track them down, they're in libraries and they're like falling to pieces. So it was quite difficult. I mean, I did manage to find some actually through overseas uh, digital portals. And I mean, those became my main source for, especially for the court proceedings. Um, I did get printouts of all the court proceedings uh, of Daisy. But then when it came down to crimes that, that the different people had committed and like Dorothea Croft, who was one of the other people that comes up in the book and is, was the first white woman who was executed in South Africa for murder. Um, there are certain things in the newspapers one can find, but that proved quite a hurdle, you know, because like in the Joburg Library they have a lot of disintegrating newspapers, but you've got to know exactly what you're looking for because otherwise you'll be sitting with like mounds of papers that'll fill this room and you don't know and they're all falling to pieces and you're trying to turn these like disintegrating pages looking for like a little fact here and there. So I mean it was going through those and then it was also there's a lot of books that were written in that period of everything about Johannesburg. It just it was a very rich time for describing the history of the city and what was going on in the city at the time. And there was a particular journalist called Benjamin Bennett who was a crime reporter from probably the early 20s, 1920s, and he was fascinated by Daisy's case and a couple of the others that I mention in the book, like the Foster Gang. And so I could go to him as a kind of my go-to guy because he wrote quite a lot of books about them. Um, and then they were just like, it's like taking snippets out of books all over the place. So it was, it was kind of corralling all this information into kind of a more narrative arc. So I think that was probably the most difficult thing was like to make things happen consequentially and time-wise they would follow. So and luckily I found killers and criminals all along the way who could like lead the story along and then there's like an interconnectedness between them all. You know, somebody knew somebody else knew somebody else and I mean however tenuous it was it have helped the story go along. Now you mentioned Dorothea Croft, the first white woman in South Africa to be executed and who Daisy was compared against. Can you just tell us a bit about her? So Daisy was compared to Dorothea Croft by Herman Charles Bosman, who people might not know was involved in Daisy DeMelka's trial in quite a big way. And Dorothea Croft had been uh, a widow who was living on a farm in Lichtenberg. So she's one of the few characters in the book who comes from outside Johannesburg. And I wanted to bring her in because she was the very first white woman who was executed in South Africa. And some people think it was Daisy, but it wasn't. And I just tell the story of how this man came to her farm one day and offered to help her sort things out because she was not a very wealthy woman, um, probably not a particularly likable woman. And this guy said, oh, well, I'll come in and help you manage the farm and help you make some money. And in the end of the day, she kind of lost the farm to him. And so she wanted to figure out how she could get rid of him. And so the story in the book is how she got in uh, cahoots with a drifter and a witch doctor. And they tried various ways to get rid of him. And finally, they did. And, you know, and they fall out from what happened after that. A lot of these murderers seem to be on the eastern side of Johannesburg. Was there any reason you could find for that? No, I mean, it was something that I kept seeing and yet I didn't draw the conclusion until quite late in writing the book that, you know, Herman Charles Bosman, Daisy DeMelka, Andrew Gibson, who was a fantastic criminal who pops up a lot in the book, and uh, William Foster, they all had some connections to where we're sitting right now. Uh, to Bertrams, to Lorenzville, to uh, Belgravia, and um, 
I don't know if any of them knew each other. I mean, the, the, the connections between all of them. But it would be fascinating to have kind of some source that would prove they all knew each other. But um, that they all ended up in Bertram's is kind of weird. I mean, there was nothing about Bertram's that really suggested itself as like the hangout for criminals. I mean, there were a lot more, uh, there was a lot more criminal activity going on in places like uh, Newtown, Fordsburg, that side of the city, the west side. So, um, yeah, and if people have trouble understanding Johannesburg, there are great maps in the front of the book that show how the city was laid out at the time. Uh, let's talk about the popularity of Daisy's trial, which was quite lengthy. People, particularly women, clamored to get in to watch it. Why was it so popular? So I think it was a couple of reasons. It was a murder trial for one. Um, and I think trials in general were very popular because this was, uh, this was when movies were going from silent into talkies. Um, and Harry Morris, who was this incredible lawyer who was Daisy's lawyer, he said in his, his autobiography, you know, trials were like better than a movie because it was, everything was real, everything was in front of you. you know, people were jumping on tables, you know, women were fainting, people were crying, and all of this all happening in front of you. And I think a large element was that. Um, a large element was, I mean, I, I think women predominated in most of these trials anyway. They were never allowed on juries, that was law. Um, but they did predominate in the audience boxes, in the, in the spectator galleries. And I think Daisy, because she was a woman, because she had been married three times, um, Herman Charles Bosman reckoned it was because women were jealous of her. And, you know, why was she this not particularly attractive woman who had managed to get three husbands and one fiance and three of them had died and you know what did she have and like she definitely deserved to die for it and they wanted to see her die and then the other thing was poison because poison is always like a, I mean always kind of elicits this um, fascination amongst people wherever it is in the world a poison trial is always you know, the arsenic trials of England or America and mothers that killed their babies. And it was a very popular form of doing away with people because it was hard to prove. So especially in the 1800s and until early 1900s, it was very, very popular. And it's the hardest thing to prove as a, a way to put someone, somebody away. And I mean, Daisy did almost get away with it. So I think it was that element as well. So it was that she was a woman, that women loved going to trials, and that it was uh, poison. Now, ultimately, Daisy was convicted of murdering her son, Rhodes. What was their relationship like? So her son was a, quite a strange character in that she had five children, only, and only he survived. And we don't know why he survived, you know, if she did do away with the other children. And she gave him this fantastic name of Rhodes Cecil. So she was naming him after the kind of the richest man in the world, Cecil John Rhodes. And he actually turned into like a little bit of a do nothing, didn't achieve anything. Um, when she had a bit of money from one of her husbands dying, she sent him to Hilton, which is extremely expensive. And, you know, he couldn't put up with more than a year. And then he came back to Johannesburg. She tried a private school in Johannesburg. And he just, he didn't crack it. And I think she slowly came to that realization that this, this boy was going to kind of, she was going to be stuck with him for the rest of her life. And I think that in the end um, was kind of what pushed her over the edge with him. Maybe she would have let him live um, if he had been less demanding. But she, uh, I think there was a belief that she was also part of the reason that he was so demanding because she gave in to him all the time. She bought him motorbikes, she bought him musical instruments which he didn't want to play. You know, he got angry, he threw tantrums, you know, he hit her. Um, so the, all of this came out in the court, which of course the audience loved. You know, it was all these stories of the mayhem that went on in the household. And lastly, for someone who mostly went by unnoticed as she murdered people, how did Daisy deal with the attention she received during the trial? Uh, she loved it, I think. Uh, she was uh, like the earliest form of a celebrity in a court. 
uh, way before social media. And she was very savvy. I think people have a particular thought of Daisy when her name is mentioned, you know. She was uh, very unattractive, she was a horrible woman, she was a murderer. But, you know, she was also incredibly strong. Women liked her. Apparently all the people in the prison just liked her, did things for her, brought her newspapers, brought her something to drink, looked after her, made sure she had, was warm in court. And she, when she came out of court, she would wave to the people. She would say, oh, um, this newspaper has published a, a picture of me that doesn't do me justice, send in another photographer. She was writing this film script while she was um, in prison, um, which was like way before these kind of things happened. Um, in the world. Uh, so I, just the, the, the kind of media savviness that she had was, uh, for me, amazing. That was author Ted Botha here discussing his latest book, Daisy DeMalka.